So welcome to the inaugural episode of the Wargame Basic Training for Empire of the Sun. This is a game by GMT. This is one of Mark Herman's most famous games. But it also has a bit of myth and lore around it that it's pretty complicated and deep and rich. And whilst that's true, we're going to do our best to get some bite-sized segments down to help us approach this game and learn the rules. So if you're an experienced Empire of the Sun player, it's probably a video series isn't for you. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is the decks of cards. So this is a card-driven game. You will have a hand of cards from which you will play, and there's a number of options um, that you're going to have at your disposal with each card play, and those cards are going to drive what you do in the game. That's the mechanism through which you're able to move units on the board and affect the outcome of the conflict. So. Unlike other card-driven games, uh, each player has their own separate deck. As you can see here, there's an ally deck, and there's a Japanese deck. And they're color-coded on the back, so they're easy to keep separate. Um, so that is a big thing to start with. So you don't have a singular deck that you're both drawing from. You have your own deck that you have to contend with. And we'll start, we'll just look at the ally deck for, for now. Uh, the deck is fairly chunky, you get a whole bunch of cards, excuse me, I've been painting earlier. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll kind of look through at a whole bunch of these, because there is a bunch of different card types, and we'll go through a few different ones. So here, let me grab one, and we'll start with this one. Okay. So, we're going to look just at the makeup of what a card looks like. And almost all of them have um, a historical photograph which represents the written event uh, on a card. The card also has a title, so this one is US Carrier Raids, and it'll have a bunch of event text or text if you're doing this portion of it. The other aspect of, of, the, of the card that you're really going to concentrate on is this number in the top left hand corner. This is what's called the Ops Value, um, and this, these range anywhere from like 1 to 3 or 4, I, th I think it's 1 to 3, I think it's 1 to 3 only. Um, and these will have a bunch of different effects and um, in, subsequent in subsequent phases if you use this card for the ops. So this is, you basically have, <laughs> well, to start with you kind of have a binary choice. Are you going to use this card for this big event down here, which will enable you to do lots of different things within, uh, like, this is the best possible, in theory, use of this card. Or, if this isn't, if this event isn't timely or you don't need to do that, you're going to use just the straight three ops. And the ops, uh, if you're using straight ops, this will dictate the number of units that you can activate, as well as how far they can move. So th th typically, in that instance, three power cards are more valuable than something like a one power card from an operation standpoint. This guy, you're going to be able to move one unit, or the units you do move will only be able to move um, their movement value times one. So if, if, a, if a unit's got a movement value of two, it could move two spaces. If you're using this card and you've got a unit that has a movement value of two, you could move that two spaces three times. So you can do up to six spaces. Um, for air naval units that can move like five points for each uh, movement uh, movement point, you know, you can get up to like 15 spaces. They can kind of fly around, do a whole bunch of cool stuff with these very powerful cards. So it's not only the units you can activate, but it also acts as a movement multiplier, basically. Uh, the other uh, major thing that you'll see, and it's not it's not on every single one of these cards, um, is that you have this little OC3 and an EC, and this one has a dash, because it doesn't have a value for, for the event uh, card. Let me find one that does real quick. Here we go. So we have Operation Tarzan here. And what you'll see, this has an OC of 2, and this has an EC of 4. And basically, this is something that you do want to take into consideration if you're trying to do um, surprise attacks 
What I mean by surprise attacks is you want to be able to get a bunch of units together and go and do an attack, hopefully with minimal resistance. So basically every single card you play and operation that you put together is by default a surprise attack. You can basically move in uh, and and do all your you know attack the units that are there. Um, if through card play or the use of these numbers, the enemy is able to react to that, um, they have the opportunity, you know, if the board state allows, to bring in more units to defend, and so the battle is maybe um, more even odds or it's less in your favor. So these values. The OC corresponds to the um, to the ops value, in the, in that the higher your ops value, the higher your OC typically is. So this has three. You're going to move a few units, and on a D10, the enemy has to roll this number, a three or less, to get to to basically negate your surprise attack. So if you think. I'm activating a bunch of units, I'm activating a bunch of units with my three. It's easier for them to, to find me out than if I was using, just operating, you know, activating one unit, they have to roll a one, and only a one on a D10. So, that's, it, you think about this intelligence, the more units you move, the easier it is for the enemy to discover your plans. And so that's where you get into these, and this is most often with these EC values, the event card values. If you have, uh, if you're doing a whole bunch of stuff with these events, because the events typically allow you to activate way more units than you normally would, then it's, this is an EC of four. So it's almost a 50% chance that they're going to discover you. You're moving a bunch of units, it's easier for, you know, intel enemy intelligence to discover what you're doing, right? It makes sense if, if you look at it that way, and that's what you're doing. So, real quick, let's see here, I've got, there's some really big ones. So you've got Operation Cherry Blossom. This has an EC value of 5. It's, it's more likely than not the enemy's going to discover what you're doing, and it will not be a surprise attack. Again, we're, we're coming back to, you're activating a whole bunch of units, um and they're going to discover what you're doing. I really like this aspect of the game because you get into some tough choices where I could do a whole bunch of big stuff with this card, but the enemy might discover what it is, and that might mean that this big operation I've got planned isn't very effective. Or I can stick with my little OC value, I can activate fewer units, um, and do maybe something else, something smaller, something diversionary, but it's much more likely to go off in my favor that I've planned out. So that's some, that's the that's another big part to be made aware of, and then real quick we'll break down some other bits and pieces on the card. So you can see here this card title is red and this one is black, and that corresponds to at the bottom of the card it says remove from play if used as an event. You basically you do this ev event one time, and that's partly game balance, that's partly um, historiosity in play. Um, you know U.S. carrier raids. It, it might break a game if you had a whole bunch. If you were able to do this a whole bunch of times, or it, it wasn't used that often, but the one time it was, it was good, kind of a thing. Operation Tarzan, you can use this multiple times, and you, you're like, really, it's just like a, a good planned offensive is really what it is. You get your nice um, historical photos of what's going on. Real quick, we'll kind of run down what the event looks like. So the first thing it says, it says activate and it tells you which of your HQs you're going to activate. And this one says, any HQ. So that's why, kind of why it's a, a card you don't throw away, because it's a slightly more generic in that way. Whereas this one, it says, activate US Central Pacific HQ only. If you're going to play this event, you can only do it on Central Pack, which is way out here on the map, and that's the only one you can do with it. Then you get into a logistics value. And the logistics value is, how many units that um, can be activated. So this can activate four units. And then there's also some bonuses you might be able to activate more units based on which HQ you're activating, but the card provides four activations. 
So this is where these things start to get really good if you can get them to trigger, because there's also conditions. So the Allied player may only activate ground and air units, of which one must be a Chinese army unit if there is uh, one on the map and in HQ range. If no such unit is available, this requirement is ignored. So that's where you get into some of the real choices, is if you either can't meet those conditions, or if it might not be the prime opportunity to, to conduct this activity, you know, it might, it might look appealing. Oh, Central Pack gives me a couple units, plus this four, I can activate six units, you know, I can get this big thing going, but it's only ground and air units, and it's gotta be a Chinese unit as well, if possible. Oh, you know, can you get that together? You can't use any naval units, so that might limit what you're able to do, or you might not have any in the area, so you're like, okay, well, this isn't great, but I can always use it for just two activations, and again, this OC value of two is very unlikely to be discovered. This EC value of four is twice as likely to be discovered. So that's really basically all these different cards that you're looking at. These are military operations. There's a little black line that says military on them. You have other other cards which are like a political event. And you just look at the, the event and it tells you what to do. You just read it. And some of these effects we'll get into in later videos, but this one's flipping into service rivalry, which basically ties up what the Japanese player is able to do with regards to combining Imperial Japanese naval units and Imperial Japanese army units. But you also draw one strategy card. So this is a very weak card. You play it for the little effect, and you draw a card. So you're, you're kind of putting off a turn, or maybe doing something that's a little bit more passive on your turn but you're building for the future as well and hammering your enemy in a different way. Uh, we also have these uh, green resource cards, and these uh, typically are to do with uh, replenishing units, getting reinforcements on the board, um, redu you know, flipping reduced units back to full strength, or, or affecting games that are in, in an indirect way uh, with regards to conflict. Those are, there's a... There's a few of those, and this is where you get into the asymmetry of the game. The Japanese player does not have many resource cards, generally speaking. And then the last card type is a blue one. Here we go. And it is a reaction card. And a reaction card, kind of from the name, you might be able to guess, it's a, it's a card that you play out of turn. Um, and this one, basically, it's an intelligence. You can change the intelligence of any operation that's going on. So if they're doing some huge thing, or even some small little um, operation, you can play this out of your hand and say, actually, you, instead of it being your surprise attack, this is my ambush. I was waiting for you to do that, and then you get to do all this stuff. During all battles of this offensive, the allied player achieves a critical hit result on all modified air naval combat die rolls of nine or greater. Normally, it's a, you crit on a on a natural nine. This one you can crit on a modified nine, which in the right in the right circumstances can be absolutely lethal. Remove from play if used as an event. But the reaction cards are played out of turn if you're playing for for the reaction event, or you can just play it on your turn normally as as an offensives card with two ops and you've got a two OC value. But basically, that's how how the game is. You'll have a hand of these cards. And the, get, uh, the core of this game is analyzing what do I have uh, and what can, I, what can I use in the best possible way. And there's one other thing that you can do with a card. Uh, if you have a card spare at the end of your turn or you can uh, do it at any point in your turn, I guess, is if you have an offensive card, and I think it has to be a military offensive, that you don't want to play now and you're saving for next round, what you can do is you can kind of put it face down and you can put a little chit on it and you're basically saying this is my future offensives card and you can use this to steal the initiative at the beginning of the whole next hand of cards and it's to launch this specific military event only. And it's a way to A, take the initiative 
which means you get the first uh, action of the game. It's a way to ensure that this card triggers this event after you've presumably spent this round setting up these conditions to be met so that you can execute a really key and important activity on it. Um, but that's the other thing that you can do is, you, you, you know, if you've got something that's amazing, like really in a big, massive, amazing offensive, but you're not ready for it, you can put it for your future offensives. And at any point uh, later on in a, in a subsequent round, you can you can kind of pull it out and be like, bam, I did this thing, but it has to be that thing. Um, and it has to be a military event. Like You can't hide political events or resource events, things like that. So that is the card composition and makeup. There is a whole bunch of these. The, you know, the actual card play and the interactions between them all is fascinating. Uh, but hopefully that was a little, little bit of insight there. Each of these cards has these little different symbols underneath the numbers, uh, the ops values. Those are basically just a quick reference. They're frankly meaningless. I never look at them. Um, those are just like, this one has a German flag because it's a war in Europe card. This one has a little arrow because it's a big military offensive. They don't, you don't actually have to look at those things. The little symbols don't mean anything. You look at the ops value and then their corresponding intelligence values and then the conditions for any event that you might want to trigger and how that corresponds with is this better or worse than using the ops now kind of a thing. So, those are the cards from Empire of the Sun. I'm going to keep this short and sweet, he says, it being 17 minutes long. But, um, appreciate you guys tuning in for this one, and we'll get into some more gameplay in the next one. Thank you.